Welcome to episode 240 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Amy Stowes about what the big five tips for teacher productivity have looked like in her daily classroom practice. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript and check out our new Truth for Teachers Writer Collective, which Amy is a part of. Teachers, if you're looking for engaging project-based lessons for students in K-12, I encourage you to take a look at the PBL tools and resources on Defined Learning. Defined Learning provides an online library of engaging real-world projects, including inspiring career-focused videos, research resources, and more to help you create deeper learning opportunities for your students. Listeners of this podcast can get free 60-day access to all of Defined Learning's PBL resources. Just go to definedlearning.com forward slash truth. That's definedlearning.com forward slash truth. So this school year has turned out to be really unprecedented in its challenges. If your coworkers are burning out and overwhelmed and your administrators feel helpless to do anything about it, let them know about the 40-hour leadership program. It's a new offshoot of my 40-hour teacher workweek program. It's designed to create change at the school level. It will help everyone in the building stay focused on what really makes a difference for kids and streamline or eliminate the rest. 40-hour leadership can be joined at any time. It's an entirely self-paced program for administrators. It only requires an upfront time investment of around eight to 10 hours, for reimagining systems and simplifying processes that will save everyone in the building time and energy every single day. We can work with your school to acquire grant funding and use professional development money to cover the cost via purchase order. And we offer additional consulting packages for personalized coaching and support. Go to 40htw.com to learn more about the 40-hour leadership program and our other 40-hour resources that are designed to help educators find a sustainable way of doing a great job for kids. It's 40htw.com. You'll see our six-week fast-track program for teachers as well, which we've recently reopened to new members, along with our 40-hour instructional coaching program, all at 40htw. The name Amy Stowes may sound familiar to you if you've been following my work for a while. If you're a member of 40 Hour, then you've seen a lot of Amy's ideas in the remote and hybrid learning bonuses that she helped me develop as part of the 40 Hour team. And you might remember her from another Truth for Teachers podcast episode that we released last spring. She shared seven takeaways from the school year that she's using to help simplify teaching from now on. Well, Amy has so many practical ideas and tips that I've invited her back to share more. Let's take a deeper look at one aspect of the 40-hour teacher workweek program that you found especially helpful during this past year when it seemed like things were changing all the time. And that's a resource that I call the Big Five Tips for Teacher Productivity. These are overarching principles from the 40-hour program that are really woven into everything we do in the course. So I'm going to share each of those five tips here, and then I'll have you talk about specifically what they look like in your teaching practice. So the first one is eliminate unintentional breaks. What did that look like for you? Yeah, so eliminating unintentional breaks is, that's like one side of the coin to me, right? Eliminating unintentional breaks is great. Like that whole getting distracted. I love some of your examples in like the big five tips audio and PDF of like, oh, you just wander and like see the TV show starting and you're like, oh, I'll just sit and watch this. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you know, just picking up the phone and kind of like, oh, I just let me see what else is here. Um, but the flip side of that is creating intentional breaks and making time for real breaks for yourself so that you feel like you can kind of, um, you can get more out of yourself if you're just like giving yourself that time to actually break things up. So, um, so back like when the pandemic first started and time was just like a mess, like I had no idea what was going on every day. <laughs> you know, It was just like hours just bled together. And 
I knew immediately like what I needed to do. I just needed to break up my day. And like, I set alarms on my phone of reminders of like, did you go for a walk yet? Like, did you do something? Did you do like a main thing? Did you, um, you know, like what a just little like check switch task by this point, if you haven't switched a task, switch your task now. So, um, you know, I don't have to do that right now in my life. Uh, because everything is busy, but it's about creating those, those points of, of like transitions and uh, break time and allowing myself to not just get sucked into like doing the same thing for a long time, but like being able to still be productive. I don't, and I'm not sure if that all makes sense, but it does, it, you know, and that's that's an interesting aspect of it that I didn't really think about because when I think about eliminating unintentional breaks, I think about creating, and you mentioned this, creating an intentional break so you can really enjoy it. If you know, if you if you say, okay, I'm going to set aside this time to sit down and watch this television show or whatever, that is, or go on Instagram. That's a lot more enjoyable than like I'm supposed to be doing this, but let me just check Instagram real quick. Oh no, thirty minutes is gone. But what I also hear you saying is that you're using these intentional breaks to create a structure in your day and to make sure that you're not sitting for too long or, you know, when class is in session, make sure you're not on your feet too long, that you're, you're having these times, um, that you're, you're checking in with yourself through these intentional breaks to make sure you're getting movement, you're getting food, you're getting rest. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And like all of that happens so, so differently like throughout this year, just I've had to kind of keep adjusting what that looks like. Because when I was like home teaching all day on my computer, just sitting at my desk, um, we had this little 15 minute break that was for, it was intended to be a screen break. And I like immediately got up and like did the dishes during that 15 minutes, or I did a load of laundry, or I like wiped down my bathroom, or like I I just I used that time to like get up and do something different. Um, and you know, that's not at all what I'm doing now. When I'm concurrently teaching now, like that 15 minute break is a chance for me to just be quiet. And like I set up routines in my class that like that's a time they can they can eat a snack or read. And so that's just a chance for me to like sit and just be there and like have a conversation maybe with the one kid that's closest to me. So kind of looking during my workday for breaks and, you know, what's nice about the big five tips is that it's something that can bleed into work and home and, you know, everything. But it's really just being mindful about kind of breaks and, you know, like your flexibility of scheduling, um, you know, look for flexibility. I built in like a couple of little five minute buffer breaks in the afternoon that are not on paper. They're not on my schedule or anything. I just know they're there. Um, just meant to be transitional times. Yeah. I love that. I find myself taking more breaks now. Like I used to feel like I needed to sit and concentrate Like, you know, if I'm planning something or I'm writing something, I need to sit down and don't get up until it's done. Like discipline myself, sit there. But I found that I actually work better when I, when I am thinking about breaks that allow me to do something different. So if I'm at home, like you're saying, even just getting up to do a load of laundry, it, it, it's giving your brain a chance, a break from the screen and a, a, a break from all of that problem solving and critical thinking. And, um, it's just sort of like clearing your head for a moment and coming back to it. And then also noticing when you're doing too many mindless tasks like that, or too many things are just not very satisfying. Mm-hmm. You know, you're cleaning up the kitchen or, you know, you're straightening up things in your classroom, just stuff or, you know, email, just stuff that isn't super satisfying and noticing, okay, what's, what's a different type of activity I can be involved in even just for a couple of minutes. And it really does so much good for my concentration and my focus. I thought that taking the breaks would make it harder to get back in, but I find that it, it really clears my head, especially if it involves you know, something very different than what I was doing before. If the activity for the break is different from the activity I'm breaking from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That contrast helps. Yes. So the second tip in the big five tips for teacher productivity is to figure out the main thing and do it first. So this is about noticing what's most important in your day and making sure that it gets done. So if you run out of time, 
at least you have that sense of satisfaction of knowing, okay, the most important thing today I did get done. Tell us what that looks like for you and also how you figure out what the main thing is, because I feel like that's something that a lot of teachers struggle with. There's so much on their plates. They're like, I don't even know what's most important. Yeah. So when I think about my main thing, it's like, what has to happen? What has to get done today? Um, Not just because I want it to. So for instance, I would really like to go through and like add commentary to all these different kids projects, or I would like to respond to all of their flip grids today or something, but that's actually not, it's not necessary. Um, it's a nice to have, it's not something that like this has to happen. So your main thing for me, it's, it's like whatever is causing me anxiety, whatever I like really want to check off my list. It's like, this is something that needs to happen. Um, one thing that helps me a lot too is like creating theme days in my to-do list. So I have like a theme day for like just cleaning up my desk and sort of wrapping up the week. I have, um, and a day for communication, a day for, you know, so like newsletters or whatever. I have a day for grading, a day for planning, a day for kind of any like task creation I need to do. And uh, hearing that you might think like, wow, like how, like how intense and rigid is that, you know, to like do these things. I wish I could do that, but that's actually not what I do. So I don't actually (laughs) necessarily do those things on those days. What it helps me do though, is think about this has to happen sometime this week. So if I don't do my grading this day, then I'm going to swap it out for something else, but I need to swap it out for something else that's just as important. So like my weekly newsletter is just as important. If I want to kind of focus on that now, I can, Um, or, you know, if I want to get ahead in my planning a little bit more because I don't feel like grading today, that's okay. Um, But it, it does need to happen. So I have like a theme for both work and home each day. But, and it's, it's like in my to-do list, it's part of the template I print out, but it's not necessarily exactly what I do that day, but it does help me know, like, this is the type of thing that I'm going to need to do on a weekly basis. So if my theme is grading, what is the one grading thing that I have to get done this week? Or if my theme is planning, what is the one thing I really need to make sure I have ready for next week? And it really allows me to think, you know, what do I have in terms of time today? What can I focus on? It helps me kind of like hone my focus and strategy. Um, So it really helps me consider how much time I need to allocate to like different tasks. Priorities have to constantly change in order for me to make thing, make sure that the main thing gets done. And, you know, if something comes up during the day and I realize, oh, you know, that's, that's going to have to be my main thing because, you know, this special ed teacher needs this paperwork for the meeting that just got rescheduled. And so I have to do it today. (laughs) You know, it's, um, priorities are always shifting, but that's, that's why I like having the to-do list because then I can move things around and it doesn't stress me out because it's all there. It's just a matter of, you know, rearranging. Yeah. That's an important thing to highlight. I move stuff around on my to-do list constantly. It's the only possible way for me to get things done because some things take longer than I thought. Some things are quicker than I thought. I get in there and I'm like, oh, I didn't actually need to do all of that. Like I can actually just do this really simple thing and that's fine. And then I can move something up for my to-do list. So constantly noticing, you know, new things that come up and um, having to move things around. Like that's a normal part of of having a productive day rather than just like creating this this list that is immutable and you have to do it exactly how it is. That's really not the idea. The idea is just to see all of your tasks together so that you can move them around and you can have that flexibility. And I think having the theme days and tying that in when the main thing makes so much sense, because it's much easier to figure out what your main thing is when you already know, okay, this is a week that I'm focusing more on unit planning, 
or, you know, my theme for today is grading. I'm catching up on grading. So what's the most important thing I need to grade? And I also like what you said about, you know, using those theme days, not as something that is like super unflexible, but almost as a way to help you prioritize each day. So if you know that, you know, you, you didn't get to finish, you know, grading the stack of paper, but you have a grading day, Thursday is your grading day. It's Tuesday. And you were hoping to get through the stack. It's like, well, I didn't get it done, but that's okay because I have these other things that are more important. And I know that Thursday is my grading day. So I, that's the day I'm going to get to catch up on everything. It, I feel like the, between the theme days and the main thing, it, it takes off that pressure of feeling like I have to do it all right now. I have to remember it all. I have to hold it all in my head. I have to keep playing this to-do list in my mind until it's all done because it's never going to be all done. So if you don't figure out a, a, a time, if you don't find a way to map things out that works for you, it can just be really overwhelming. And I think what you're describing just sounds so much more or so much less stressful. Yeah, I, I find it less stressful. I, um, sometimes people see my to-do lists at work and they're like, wow, <laughs> just like, look at that. Um, but it, it's funny to me. Because I'm like, well, you know, it's just, it's a little bit different than it looks on paper, you know? Um, it is. And the thing is, like a lot of people who don't keep to-do lists, what they're doing is they're keeping it in their head and they're forgetting things and they're remembering and it's popping back. I'm like, oh yeah, I was supposed to do this. And then they go and do that thing. And then it's like, oh yeah, I was supposed to do this. And they go and do that thing. And what the to-do list really is doing is enabling you to write down things as you think of them and pick a time when it's going to work. So like I might remember, oh, I need to call, you know, this X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, well, you know, I'm in the middle of something right now. I'm not going to stop and call them immediately, but I can put it on my to-do list. And I know tomorrow afternoon, I'm also making other calls. I'll put it there. Or this is really urgent. So I'll put it on the to-do list for this evening to make sure it gets done. But I don't have to stop and do it right away. And now I have all this mental bandwidth that's freed up for the task I was supposed to be focusing on because I don't have to remember to do this thing. It's written down now. Yeah. Anytime I'm stressed, my first step is just to open up a blank page and like brain dump all of the things that I would like to get done. And like all of the like little bothersome things that I want to do as well as big things. Yes, I do the same thing. And I know not everyone's brain works like that. Some people, if they were to make like my husband, for example, would never yeah. do that. He would never <laughs> make this like long list of all the stuff he needs to do. But when your brain works like yours, Amy or mine, yeah. it really does help because it's like, okay, now I don't have to, it, it's not all in my head. I have it written down. Nothing's going to get forgotten. And I can look to see, oh, it's actually not that much, or this is way too much. Some of the stuff is just not that important. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. That'll get done in the winter. This I can do next spring. Like, it's just not that big of a deal. It's not that urgent. But trying, just feeling like there's all the stuff that has to get done, getting it down on paper or, you know, digitally paper, doesn't matter. Just out of my head really helps. Yes. So let, let's talk about this third strategy um, in the big five tips for teacher productivity, which is working ahead by batching and avoiding multitasking unless the work is mindless. What does that look like for you? Yeah. So kind of this goes back to the theme days too, right? Like kind of batching tasks together. Um, so my teammate and I set aside Thursday afternoons and we just plan for the week ahead. And so we just after school, we just knock out the like template for the upcoming week. Kind of what are the things that we're plugging in? We often will be like both looking at resources at the same time and um, kind of being like, oh, look at this thing. Um, you know, and we're doing almost all this virtually. So, you know, it's like, oh, you're all like screen share this thing I found. What do you think? We should do this. No, we should save this for later. We'll like jot that down. Um, and I love that. Like we just do it in one chunk. Um, and sometimes this takes, you know, more like two hours, but it, it's worth it, right? Like it's, it's so much better because we're kind of doing it at the same time and it's a little bit more efficient. Um, and just kind of like jotting down the plan for the week. And then what I do after that is just add in a whole bunch of links to the slideshow of like, this is, this link that I need to add in, this link I need to add in. And if there's anything else I still need to do after that, I'll just make a quick little to-do list for myself. Um, just like at the top of the slides of like, I need to do these quick little things before 
um, before we actually start teaching um, the next week. So that like whole batching process for planning is, I mean, planning for me, if there's one thing that you're going to batch, have it be planning, um, you know, at least a week at a time. I found that this year, honestly, I couldn't do more than a week at a time just with all of the changes. Things were constantly changing. The date of when I was going to be in person changed several times this year. Um, it's a new grade level to me. Thing, like there's, there's just a lot this year. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the past, I would plan really by unit. So I would plan uh, at least a month at a time. And I would always allow myself flexibility. So I would plan a kind of individual stations and small groups, um, more by a week at a time, but I would have like mini lessons and dates for assessments sketched out all pretty much a, a month, a month in advance. Um, and so that, that helps me a lot. So, I mean, if there's anyone that's sort of still planning day to day to day, um, or even like every other day or something, the biggest shift I think that they're going to feel is if they can just get get ahead in their planning because it, I can't, I can't even express how, like what relief I feel at, at the end of every week when I'm like, I am set for the week, you know, like I'm ready. Yes. And all of those things are planned. I have all of the links in one place. Um, it's all there for me. And I'm not like, I know that I'm not going to have to hunt down for it later. I'm not going to have to like, stress to find little extra things like it's it's ready for me and that feeling of like getting through a whole stack of papers or projects all at once is a great feeling like batching gives me such energy <laughs> of like I got through that thing um so yeah that, and and another thing I've in terms of the like avoid multitasking unless the work is mindless. One thing I've noticed this year is like the whole mindless work has been a little bit different. Like I talked about like copying all those little links and stuff like, and kind of posting to Google classroom, like here's this thing um, that I need to attach and check off little names. And like, there's, it's sort of a, you know, or like I need to screenshot this thing and upload it. I need, I need to add like a, you know, a Pear Deck drawing feature to like these 30 slides. You know, it's like not that exciting. It's, it is fairly mindless and kind of boring. So that is something that I can do like while I'm watching TV um, and, or while I'm listening to a podcast and it, I can make it a little bit more enjoyable by sort of just embracing the fact that like, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like a slow, slightly mindless task. So I can, I can do that as I'm doing something else. Yeah, that's exactly what I do too. Cause it, it does make the, the, the sort of mundane and rote tasks feel more enjoyable and just being mindful of it, as you're saying, like, make sure that it's a task that, that is mindless. Cause if you need to concentrate and, you know, you're, you're trying to watch TV or listen to a podcast or an audiobook or something at the same time, or, you know, or switch back and forth between that and something else, it can make it take longer. Um, mm -hmm. your, your point about, about, um, getting ahead in lesson planning, I feel like is so huge. Um, you know, to me, that's the biggest advantage of, of batching, of doing these similar tasks together rather than just doing a little bit each day. So, I mean, a simple example would be, um, you know, answering emails, say three times a day, instead of each one as they come in, you're batch answering that email. But lesson planning, I feel like is a huge area for teachers where, you know, if you can plan that whole unit in advance, you're not going to feel like every single night, you know, there may be something else that comes up. You may have a sick family member. You may have a, a fun activity that you were invited to, a happy hour, or, you know, sitting outside with the neighbors over a fire pit or something. And you're like, man, I can't because I have to go in and do lesson plans. If you have worked ahead, then you don't have that same day by day lesson planning hassle. And batching really is the way to do that. And I feel like it, that's the way that teachers used to plan when I started teaching 
um, you know, in, in 1999 was when I first started teaching. And that was a normal way to plan, to have a whole unit at a time. And I feel like it has fallen out of favor in recent years because there's this emphasis on being very um, student driven, you know, and I will see teachers say all the time, like, I don't, how could I possibly plan for a whole month when I don't know what my kids are going to need? I don't even know what they're going to need on Friday. How could I, how could I plan that far in advance? And I feel like, yes, in an ideal world, absolutely. If you had two hours of planning time every single day, like teachers do in some other countries, absolutely plan, you know, sketch out your unit. So you know where you're trying to take kids. And, you know, when you're working backwards from the assessment, what do I need them to learn? And then how am I going to get them there? That's, that's important. But sure, you could do a lot more of that if you had the planning time. But with the reality of what we're working with, that's just not possible. And I think it puts an unfair pressure on teachers to feel like, oh, in order for me to be responsive from kids' needs, I can't use my same lesson plans from last year. I can't use anything prepackaged. I have to create it all from scratch based on my students. And I have to do it all the night before because I can't plan tomorrow's lesson until I understand what they learned today. And I just think that is such an overcomplication of teaching. We have we have skills and standards that kids have to master by the end of the year, regardless. We have pacing guides, we have curriculum maps, <laughs> plan it out. And as you're saying, it's, a, it's an overview. It's okay, most likely, I know I need to have the end of unit test on this day, which means I have to have tests on this day, which means quizzes on these days. Okay, what are the activities that I'm gonna do in here to help prepare kids for this, give them practice, um, make sure they're getting the direct instruction they need. And you just sort of map it out. And so you may, at the start of the week, maybe like I used to spend Sunday afternoons, I'd spend an hour or two going through and just tightening things up and finalizing plans and maybe giving myself options. So it's like, okay, if the kids seem like they're getting it, give them this. If they don't seem like they're getting it, then do this review activity. But there's no way that I can envision a teacher having any semblance of work-life balance if you're not planning tomorrow's lesson until the night before. That is so much pressure. Yeah, I hear that pushback too of like, well, you know, teachers who plan that far in advance, like they just aren't good teachers because they're not kind of being super responsive. But to me, like that's why I have the structures I do. So like I have a reading and writing workshop model so that I can pull kids for reading strategy groups I can, you know, like I have the small group time kind of embedded into, um, it's already embedded into my schedule. So that's what I can change last minute if I want to. And I can do different things with different groups for, you know, my small groups for math. I can change what I'm doing with different kids. I, so for instance, after every, um, after every math quiz, when I taught sixth grade, what I, I had it organized by diff, I had the quiz organized and grouped by different kind of skills and standards. So I had different parts grouped. So I would know that if they, you know, did really badly on part A and I would track their grades that way, and kind of look, cause I also do standards based grading. So I would look and kind of see, okay, this group of kids, they really need to focus on part you know, part A, this group of kids needs to focus on part B, part C, everyone in the class did great. Awesome. Um, this group needs to focus on part D, this group, they got pretty much everything right on the quiz. So we're going to do an extension activity. So that clearly wasn't planned in my, like in my plan book ahead of time, because those small groups are flexible. So I had to wait until they took the quiz, which I had like on had them take on Friday and then I would do those small groups the week after. So I had to wait until they took the quiz to be able to make those groups. But I knew what I was doing. I knew that the station with me for math was going to be that like that reteaching or extension activity regardless. And I knew what I would have to do to reteach that skill because I just taught it previously in the unit. And I can figure out that one of the other stations is going to be them doing quiz corrections on their own. And then the other two stations can be games or an online program. So I can plan ahead, but still be responsive. And that's the same thing with like reading and writing conferences. Like I can, I can respond to kids in person with a workshop model. Like I can plan my mini lesson ahead of time. I can plan my closing and I can 
plan that I'm going to be doing conferences during that middle time. I don't necessarily know which kids I'm going to see or what skills I'm going to teach because I can be responsive in the moment in that one-on-one -on -one conference. Um, so I don't have to have like a plan in mind. I can, you know, know generally what I'm going to do without planning every moment. That's still planning ahead and like being ready to ready to kind of move forward. Right. And, you know, for anyone listening to this who is a new teacher or new to the district, to the grade level, to the curriculum, you know, I'll add the caveat here also that this does get easier with practice. The longer you've been teaching and the longer you've been teaching the same topics or skills or age groups, it becomes easier to predict. So you can kind of tell like, okay, I know every single year when I teach fractions, like half the class is not going to get it. Like yeah. <laughs> start, start planning the extra review activities, start planning the extra, like this is, this is not going to go well. So, you know, there, there's, there's certain things that, you know, you're going to need to spend more time on. You also get to know, you're, you can start anticipating with kids too. You can already start to tell, okay, if the kids didn't master one, this one skill, they're really going to struggle on this other one. So it just, all of this with experience, you, you learn to be able to plan on the fly. So if this is still hard for anyone who is listening, you are not alone. I think we've all been there. Uh, Amy, I know you switched grade levels, you know, from, from sixth grade to second grade. So you know what this is like, but it's something to work toward. It, it's a goal. It's a goal to work toward to get to this place where you can kind of anticipate and you have these structures in place. Um, so then when the day comes, you can just say, okay, I already had this um, you know, intervention plan for the kids who were struggling and the kids who are struggling can just take it away. Yeah. So the next strategy is to look for innovative ways to relax any standards that create unnecessary work. What does that look like? So this, um, this past year, that's been a lot of like doing, doing what I know works like read alouds are good. Having them write things on a whiteboard and hold it up for me works virtually. It also works in person. Reusing the same activities and like games and structures, um, kind of not expecting myself to come up with something new and different all the time or waiting for this perfect system to arise. But you know, looking for things that are multi-purpose, looking for things that can be reused, um, and just kind of taking, taking, a, taking a structure and reusing it and allowing it to be kind of flexible. So as, you know, as I've mentioned, I'm like a bit of a perfectionist, a bit of like looking for ways to do things really well. And, um, and sometimes that is just like creating unnecessary work. So, you know, if I'm looking for tech tools or an activity or a procedure that I'm going to teach, I want to look for something that's like pretty multi-purpose. I'm not going to add something that is only useful for one time unless it's like a really special event. Um, and, you know, making sure that kids are mostly successful with what I'm already doing before I start adding in new stuff um, and kind of allowing allowing myself to just test it out. Like I don't have to wait for the perfect system before I just try it. Like I don't have to think of every single possibility of what's going to happen. I can try, you know, I can plan ahead, but I don't, I'm not going to know how everything will go until I actually do it. So when I was like moving into concurrent instruction, I did really try to like think about all of these things, but there was no way that I was going to anticipate every possibility. And at one point I did just tell myself, like, just stop, you know, like you've, you've thought about it, you've planned, um, at this point, you just need to learn from the mistakes that happen. Like you're just going to have to live through it and see how it goes. Um, you know, it goes back to like embracing sort of a growth mindset as a teacher of like, I can, I can do better each time. I can learn from things. Um, you can ask students for feedback. And so it's a lot about, you know, relaxing, relaxing some of your expectations that maybe you have, 
or these like I kind of imaginary ideals of what you wish things were like. Um, to me, all of that goes back to like just relaxing your standards. Um, and I, I like that phrase that you say of like, you know, where no one else will notice but you. Yes. And trying to think like, will someone else actually notice or <laughs> or will they will they not? Because <laughs> they probably don't. Because also other people are maybe not paying as much attention to you as you think they are. <laughs> it's true. And also only we know what was in our heads. You know, like if you teach it, if you had in this idea, let's say you were going to do this elaborate bitmoji classroom for your students, they didn't know you were going to do that. If you give them a hyperdoc that just has like plain text links, they're not going to know that 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 you were thinking about a bitmoji classroom. And the, the text links work just as well. For some kids, it might work even better, maybe actually easier to navigate and less visual clutter for them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that could be a standard where it's like, I have to have this, this perfect, you know, classroom setup or virtual classroom setup or online setup. But actually the only person who had that whole thing envisioned was you and you know families don't know your principal doesn't know your students didn't know what you were thinking about doing and you decided to simplify all they know is the end outcome and if the end outcome works for them then that's a that's a great way to just relax your standards and not create unnecessary work for yourself based on what you had envisioned because you're not actually letting other people down they weren't expecting that of you that was something you just had in your own head yeah and also one thing that i've kind of told myself multiple times is like, I can say no right now. Like, mm. It doesn't mean that I have to say no forever. It doesn't mean that I can't do this later or next year or just in the future. I can just tell myself, you know, it's, it's a no for now. Yes. I love that. I love that. I, I keep a long-term to-do list, just like ideas, just stuff that I might want to do one day. And it's really cool. Like sometimes I go back and revisit stuff that I thought about years before and it ends up looking a lot different than what I had, you know, originally planned. But just knowing that like, you know, if there's something fun or creative that I'm excited about, but it just is not a priority. I have other stuff I have to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Telling yourself it's a no for now. Love that. Good. So that leads us to the final uh, aspect of the big five tips for teacher productivity, which is using scheduling to create boundaries around your time. So this is about knowing that the job of teaching is really never done and it will expand to fill whatever amount of time you allow. If you give it 40 hours or 60 hours or 80 or 100, you can work on teaching stuff for any amount of those hours, probably more than 100 hours a week because there's always something you could be doing. So you really do have to to create boundaries and you can do that by scheduling. And I know you're really good with scheduling. You've experimented a lot with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I mentioned my to-do list before and one thing that I did with the to-do list was I thought about the things that I want to do on the weekends and in the evenings as well. And I kind of put like recurring tasks that I want to happen. And when I did that, I realized, you know what, I'm like filling up my Saturday and Sunday and my evenings with things that I want to do. Like it's, mm. it's not that hard for me to think about things that I want to happen during those times. And so when I did that, I was like, that automatically kind of compresses teaching to other hours. Um, there's only so many spots in my to-do list that I can fill up with stuff because that's the time that I've allotted. So, you know, kind of pushing myself to like to schedule the other stuff too, to not just schedule work, but to schedule the other things and kind of allow work to fit around other priorities I have. Like, you know, if I want to go drive somewhere and take a long hike or something like I'm allowing myself to have the whole day of Saturday where I'm not, I'm not doing any work. And I usually don't work on, um, on Saturdays. And then on Sundays, I basically only kind of look at my to-do list for the upcoming week. And maybe I'll do like other, other sort of side jobs, but I don't do like teaching work for my classroom. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like to, I like to know which nights I'm going to work longer and which ones I don't. And, you know, it's, it's hard because there were a few 
weeks this year where I did work really long hours, but they were transitional periods, um, you know, right at the beginning of the year. And then when I really was transitioning um, for when I was planning on transitioning to like in-person teaching and then that got moved and I had to switch classrooms in the building. So I had already set up my classroom for in-person teaching one way. And then I had to switch classrooms and set up a whole different classroom and rearrange everything. And so, yeah, there were a couple weeks where I was working, you know, longer hours, but longer hours for me is, you know, 50 to 55 hours. That's like a really intense long week for me. And so I'm okay doing that every once in a while when I know that it's, I'm investing that time and it's going to be helping me out later. And I'm putting that time in now so that I don't have to stress and I don't have to kind of keep working those long hours. Um, so, you know, that whole, like you scheduling to create boundaries around your time works on multiple levels. Like it works within a day and then it works within a week and then it works within a season and it works thinking about an entire year too. Yes. And it's, it, I find for me, it's a very flexible process. So I usually start the, I mean, I'll, I'll have like goals for like quarterly goals and things like that. But usually what I do is at the start of the week on Sunday, I look to see, okay, what are the days that I'm going to be working late? Am I going to be working on evenings? Do, am I going to have a whole day off? Like you said, I love to hike. Um, so yeah. if I'm going to hike, I don't want to come back and get on the computer afterwards. I just, you know, I'm going to just feel that bliss from just being yeah. outdoors. And so I'm like, okay, what, what day this week? Look at the weather, look at my schedule and pick, okay, this is going to be the afternoon for that. And I'm not going to schedule anything. So I, I kind of take it on a week by week basis, just based on what else is going on based on the temperatures and, you know, all that sort of thing and, and sort of plan out my week. Think about what are the fun things that I also want to do and set aside yeah. time for those and then fill in the work around that. It's like, okay, well, there's, you know, it's supposed to rain on Thursday and, you know, I don't have any other things going on. That would be a good time to really tackle this project. So I, I tend to look at it week by week and then I can be flexible. If Thursday comes and I don't want to do it, I can move it around. I mean, that's the great thing about, you know, working ahead and not doing stuff the day before it has to be done. You know, you can mm -hmm. be flexible. You can say, well, I'd plan to do it Thursday, but I actually don't want to, or this other thing came up and now I can't. I can kind of be flexible with it. So how does, how does the flexibility piece work for you? Yeah, um, definitely this like very similar to that of thinking about what, what can I do when, um, and allowing myself to kind of change my mindset this year a bit more, um, so like in, in the past, I, I got really good at like using my planning time effectively and like really, you know, using that I had an hour and using that hour really well and doing, you know, exactly what I wanted to kind of get done during that time. And this year, I, I just, I can't, I can't use my planning time the same way, um, it's just an afternoon. It's only 30 minutes. I usually don't get that whole 30 minutes by a long shot. So it's like this kind of 20 minute time frame where I have to go be not in my space. And it's, it's just, it's just different. Like I, I need to rearrange my day in a way that, that makes sure I can get other things done. Um, so I have to, there's no point in me being like frustrated about the way that I wish my planning time was or getting frustrated about how, you know, well, the, my school hours change this year, even like what time we start and end is different. Like there's no, <laughs> there's nothing that <laughs> there's no sense in me being like kind of frustrated about that. Like I, <laughs> I can just, I can just be a little bit more flexible in changing my routines as to like how is this best going to help me use what I have. Um, 